Let's talk about some important types of subatomic particles. One important type, well, I suppose we can start with just a proton. Now, what would we say would be a good atomic number and mass number for a proton? Uh, one. Would be the atomic number? Yeah. And the mass number? Um, two. Why two? Because then one neutron, one proton. That's true. But however, this is just a proton. Oh, right. So then one. Right. We just want to know what would be appropriate numbers to write for a single proton. It's possible to have a proton by itself. So we might use lowercase p for proton, then its atomic number would be 1, and its mass number would be 1. That's me. And how about a neutron? What would be the correct numbers, the correct a and z for a neutron? Um, one neutron would have 0 for its atomic number, <coughs> and then 1 because it has a mass of one atomic mass in it. Here's where maybe instead of thinking of this as the atomic number, we can use our broader definition and just think of this as a measure of the charge. A proton has a plus one charge and a neutron has a zero charge. That might be more comfortable than to continue thinking of that as atomic number. Uh, probably you're not going to see this symbol used very much, but it's actually pretty common to see neutrons written like this. A neutron would be written like this with zero charge and a mass number of one. By the way, before I forget, I should point out a common mistake. Remember, what does Z stand for? The atomic number. And A stands for the mass number. But you can see those are misleading symbols. At least A is. It would be very easy to think that A stood for the atomic number because it's got an A in it. So even though A has an A, it does not stand for the atomic number. It stands for the mass number. I don't know where that comes from. Maybe because the word mass has the letter A in it. And this is probably called the atomic number because it's always an integer or a number, I think Zollen is German for number, and the Germans figured out all this chemistry. That's probably where this came from. Okay, so anyway, uh, how about an electron? What would be the correct A and Z for an electron? Um, <clears throat> the A would be negative one, or, well, oh, sorry, zero. There's no protons, or so let's start with the Z. What would be a good Z? Negative one. Is that the top number or the bottom number? Bottom. Yeah. Now this is the reason why I was saying that yeah, sometimes so thinking of this as the atomic number is not very clear. Our broader definition is that Z is a measure of charge. Our broader definition of Z is that it's a measure of charge. That subsumes the definition of the number of protons or the atomic number. Well, the charge of an electron is negative one. And then what would its A be? Zero. Yeah, it's not really exactly zero, but it's so much smaller than these masses that we treat it like a zero. So that's right. This would be the way to write this down. It has a z of negative one and a mass number of zero. And this is, again, actually a pretty common way of writing an electron, so it's important to be comfortable with this. Ah, before I forget, suppose someone talks about carbon-12. What does the 12 tell you? The mass number? That's right. So carbon-12 is this. This is just a two, two different conventions for saying the same thing. So when people just give you a number after the name, they mean the mass number. They don't need to bother telling you the atomic number because we could figure that out from the fact <laughs> that it's carbon. In fact, it's 6. So if people say carbon-14, what's that? That would be the mass number. Right, that's what I meant. You can see how easy it is to think that A stands for the atomic number, but it's really the mass number. That's right, the mass number is 14, but the atomic number is still 6. Okay, so I just wanted to mention this is another very common convention that you'll see. If they just see one single number given after the name of the element, they're giving you the mass number. It's the same as writing it like this. A lot of problems is an alpha particle. So we need to memorize what is an alpha particle. I don't know if you, if you know what an alpha particle is. 
really. An alpha particle turns out to be a helium nucleus. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus. Well then, what are the numbers? What are the normal numbers for a helium nucleus? What, what's the atomic number for helium? Two. And it turns out that the normal mass number is four. We should pretty much memorize this. We should memorize these numbers for a helium nucleus. You don't need to memorize the two, but you should memorize that the four is the mass number for a normal helium nucleus. And that means those are also the numbers for the alpha, because alpha just is the helium nucleus. These are just two ways of writing the same thing. An alpha particle just is a helium nucleus. We need to have that memorized. You might also hear about beta particles. Well, it turns out that a beta particle is an electron. So what should be A and Z for this beta particle? Uh, a should be zero, mm -hmm. and then Z should be negative one. Those are the numbers we've already learned about for electrons. That's a beta particle. Another particle that you might sometimes see is a positron. I don't know if you've heard of antimatter, but it turns out that for every bit of ordinary matter, there's also an antiparticle the antimatter. Antimatter has the same mass and the opposite charge. Antimatter has the same mass and the opposite charge. That's why it's called anti, because it's opposite in charge. An antiparticle has the same mass and the opposite charge of the regular particle. <coughs> Since a positron, and a positron is an anti-electron, Positron is the antiparticle for an electron. I guess this name makes sense. It's called tron because that's the end of electron, and posa because it's a positive electron, so to speak. We can still keep using the symbol beta because this is very closely related to an electron, but what would be the correct A and Z for a positron? A would be zero, and then the Z would be positive one. That's right. And now we're getting very comfortable, I guess, with using Z as just a measure of charge. Clearly, for an electron, we can't think of Z as the number of protons or the atomic number, but we can still think of it as the charge. That's our better, new, more general definition of Z. These aren't even nuclei, but we can still fit them into the same symbology by treating this as the charge. So we, it's convenient to use the same symbol for a particle and the antiparticle. We just have different numbers. Notice that the antiparticle, as you figured out, has the same mass number but the opposite charge number. So we've started to basically treat A as the mass number, and we're kind of treating Z as the charge number. That's not a, the, the official name, but maybe a good name for Z would have been charge number. There's also an antiproton and an antineutron, but I don't think those are going to be important in your course. The only thing that you're likely to see, I think, is the antielectron, and will be called a positron, a positive electron. So notice, what's the mass of a positron? Zero. Zero. Don't confuse that with a proton. A proton has a plus one mass and a one charge, uh, I'm sorry, a one mass and a one charge. Whereas this has a plus one charge, but almost no mass. It's not literally zero, but it's so small that we can ignore it, just like the electron. And then there are gamma particles. Gamma particles turn out to be high frequency EM, high frequency photons. just a high frequency photon, which is an EM wave. So what would be the correct A and Z for a gamma particle? Good, good. We briefly <laughs> talked about the fact that photons literally have no mass and literally have no charge. So these are not approximations. A gamma particle has a zero and a zero. By the way, if an alpha particle is just helium and a beta particle is just electron, why don't they just call them helium and call them electrons? Well, historically, the way these were discovered is when they, <coughs> when they were first learning about the nucleus, I think it was Rutherford that did this, 
he would take a sample and he would throw things at it, like he would throw electrons at a sample to try to break it up and see what would come out. And he noticed that when he threw electrons at the sample, sometimes he detected a particle that had a mass of four and a charge of two, and sometimes he detected a particle that looked like this, and sometimes a particle that looked like this, but, uh, but when he was first detecting them, he didn't know that they were helium particles or electrons. I don't even know if the electron had been discovered yet at that time, so this is just historical. The only reason we have two sets of names is because when these were first discovered, they didn't know that alpha particles were helium, so now it just makes twice as much work for students to learn both sets of names.